Welcome everybody to our um, uh, pilot talk for the processing and memory technology workshop. And we're really glad to have Professor Jinru Chiu with us today. I hope I'm pronouncing this halfway correctly, your name. That's Sorry. correct. Um, Jinru, she received her PhD in electrical engineering from um, USC in 2001. Currently, she's a professor and the director of the graduate program in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Syracuse University. She has more than 20 years of research experience in machine intelligence and more than 15 years of experience in neuromorphic computing, which is very impressive. Um, she's a recipient of uh, numerous awards and um, currently she serves as associate editor for the IEEE Transactions on Neural Networks and Learning Systems and IEEE Circuits and Systems Magazine. Also served on uh, program committees of very many major conferences. And uh, she's director of the NSF Industry University Collaborative Research Center, ASIC, um, of the, uh, the, the Syracuse site of this center. So Jindra, we are very glad to have you with us today. And uh, we're looking forward to your talk. I hope the screen sharing from your side. Okay, yes, will I work. will start sharing screen. Yes. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. Yes, yeah, uh, thank perfect. you. Okay. Thanks. So the thank floor you all. Is all yours. Yeah. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So um, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk about our work on neuromorphic computing um, on the uh, PIM workshop. So the neuromorphic hardware basically has the very highly uh, closely integrated memory and computing and the features of Neumann architecture. Um, strictly speaking, uh, my research is not on hardware design, but to um, study mod computing models that can utilize those special features. Um, however, I hope that those new computing paradigm can uh, give some inspiration to the hardware designer and architecture designer in this area. So um, this is the outline of my talk. I will first very briefly talk about the background of spiky neural network and the neuromorphic hardware. And then I will introduce three of our works, including anomaly detection, uh, supervised learning, and also spatial temporal pattern detection. And finally are the conclusions. Um, so spiky neural network is a set of very special neural networks. And compared with artificial neural network, the specialty is all the neurons communicate um, and encode information using event-driven and asynchronous spikes. So the biological, uh, so their operation uh, computation is biological plausible. Um, the computing and the learning happened based on the charging and the discharging of the membrane potential and the synapse plasticity. There has been many hardware and software system developed for the simulation of spiky neural network. Um, these include the neural grid, brain scale, uh, Chunors, Loihi, Spinnaker, etc. And some of them have already featured um, very um, impressive energy efficiency, such as IBM True North and Intel Loihi. And uh, this comes from the non-von Neumann architecture and also the event-driven implementation and operation. However, in order to utilize those hardware platform uh, is not, not easy. Um, the challenge is, how biological neurons or nerve systems learn, inference, and encode information are still not well understood. So the goal of our research is to investigate novel learning and inference models that can utilize those neuromorphic computing platform for energy, energy efficient applications. So here I will introduce very briefly um, about the IBM True North and the Intel Loihi processor. These are two platforms that we're familiar with. The True North neurosynaptic processor was produced by IBM in 2014. Um, it has 4,000 neuromorphic cores on the chip. And overall it has 1 million neurons and 256 million synapses. It has very low power consumption, only 70 milliwatt. 
and the one chip can already be uh, can readily be tiled with other chips. And IBM also provide Eden energy efficient deep neural net, uh, neuromorphic networks, which is a MATLAB based uh, design environment. However, it focus only on the feed forward networks. Um, and uh, um, the true north does not support synapse plasticity. This basically means it does not support on chip or in hardware learning. And the Intel Luigi processor was developed in 2018. It has 128 neuromorphic cores. And uh, each core has uh, 1024 compartment. And each compartment could be viewed as a very primitive spiking neuron. So overall, the chip can provide up to 128,000 neurons and 128 million synapses. And the Loihi chip has very flexible architecture. It has features such as sparse network compression, uh, core to core multicast, etc. And uh, it supports also some bio-inspired -in functions, such as homeostasis, reward-based learning. And the one important feature of a very special feature the Loihi support is on-chip synaptic learning. So for using Loihi, we can achieve, achieve in-hardware learning. So um, next, I'm going to talk about our work on anomaly detection using Bayesian inference. Um, as we know, um, neurons performs integrated and fire functions. So the output can be cal calculated as the integrate of the input plus a bias and going through an activation function. If we consider a, ta a target neuron, or we also call it post-synaptic neuron to represent a hypothesis, and we consider the source neuron or the presynaptic neuron to represent some evidence, then, and also we let the weight of their connection um, to be set to represent the log condition probability of the source neuron given the condition of the target. Then basically um, the spiking activity or the excitation of the target neuron is proportional to the likelihood of the hypothesis under the given evidence. So this basically means I can use a neuron, an integrated and fire neuron to implement uh, a Bayesian network. And uh, so if we use neuron to represent possible observation of features or feature combinations, and we pack all the mutually exclusive observation into something called a lexicon. For example, we can have a lexicon of shape, which packs all the possible shapes, and lexicon of color, which packs all the possible colors. And then the connection between the neuron uh, in different lexicon can be established or learned but based on the training set. And all the neuron inside the same lexicon are mutually exclusive or mutually inhibit each other. And um, then Every, next, uh, every neuron in this network estimates its own likelihood or estimate the likelihood um, of the um, observation represent by itself. Then basically, if we um, observe something, for example, if the training set, uh, we continuously observing red apple and yellow banana. And if we observed some round shape, then the red color will have high likelihood and the neuron represented um, yellow color will have low likelihood. However, if we observed something red, uh, something round, but yellow with yellow color, then basically a very low likelihood uh, uh, observation is received and some anomaly is detected. So this is the basic idea of our anomaly detection system, or rather it's actually a detection of the surprise. So based on this idea, we developed NRAD. Um, we divide all the, key, uh, all the lexicons into two categories. One is the key lexicon. The key lexicon contains features to be tested. And the other category is the supporting lexicon, which represent features that um, basically forms the context environment. And again, every lexicon contains many, many neurons which 
represent mutually exclusive observations. So all the neurons in the key lexicon will estimate their, the likelihood of the observation it represents. And then for each key lexicon, an anomaly score is calculated. It's calculated as the likelihood of T, neuron Tmax, where Tmax is the most possible observation, minus the likelihood of neuron T actual, which represents the actual observation, divided by the LT max. So basically, if the actual observation has very low likelihood, then we will receive a high anomaly score. And then we calculate also a network anomaly score, which is the average of, the, um, of all the key lexicon anomaly scores. As we can see, this network is very simple. It has only two layers, one layer of supporting lexicon and one layer of key lexicon. So basically, we're, we have pushed the complexity into the network design. So how the key lexicons and the supporting lexicons are selected is very critical. And we have an automatic um, framework to do that through learning. Um, if you are interested, you can check our um, TNN LS paper in 2017. So, um, <laughs> so in this work, um, we, our interest is to map this network to uh, two norms. And uh, um, we know that each key lexicon will connect to multiple um, supporting lexicons. Again, each lexicon contains hundreds of thousands of neurons. So each connection is a fully connected layer. So we take all the weight matrix um, and the stack, we stack all the weight matrix connecting to the same key lexicon and form a large weight matrix. And one of the limitation of the true norms is the core um, has 256 inputs and 256 neurons. It can be viewed as a crossbar with that has the size 256 by 256. So we have to partition this um, large weight matrix into uh, 256 by 256 patches and map them to the cores. And because multiple cores are used, so at the end, another core is needed in order to merge the result of each column. So in order to minimize the number of cores, uh, we have set a constraint that each key lexicon can be connected to no more than 15 supporting lexicons. And uh, um, this can be achieved by adding some um, constraints in the network construction step. And this constraint, as we will show later, uh, will introduce only 1% drop in the quality. However, it can save the hardware cost significantly. And another limitation of the true norms is um, for each column in the crossbar, it only supports four different weights. And each, for all the connections on the same row, they must select the weight with the same rank. So all these, these four uh, weights are ranked from one to four. So for all the connections on the same row, they must select the weight with the same rank. And this limitation obviously will reduce the hardware cost. However, it imposes significant constraint to this weight matrix design. So what we did is uh, we take three physical rows in the crossbar to represent each row in the weight matrix. And these three rows have the weights one, two, and four. So their combination can represent any weight from zero to seven. So this means we need to quantize the weight in our matrix into eight levels. And so we, we mentioned that um, each column has four weights. So we still, we have used three of them. We reserved one rank for a special signal uh, clock signal, which will be discussed later. So this quantization is acceptable because for our specific application anomaly detection, the um, actual, if there's an, an abnormal, uh, if an, an anomaly is detected, 
then its likelihood is usually much lower than the, mo uh, the maximum likelihood. So this basically means we have a quite large noise margin, which allow us to use a, a coarse-grained quantization. So, um, so in this way, we have um, we you, we mapped the weight matrix into the true noise. And uh, to calculate the anomaly score is challenging because the neuromorphic hardware does not directly support numerical calculation because all the information are represented as spikes, spike trains. And the computation is done by charging and discharging membrane potential. So to calculate anomaly score first, we need to find the maximum likelihood among hundreds or thousands of neurons inside the same key lexicon. And each likelihood is represented by the spiking rate of the neuron. So one approach is we can count the number of spikes within a given time and then compare them one by one. However, this is very time consuming. And another challenge is we need to calculate the ratio. We need to cal perform the division function, which is almost not possible, or at least not directly supported by true norms. So um, our solution is we utilize a burst neuron, which provided by true norms, to implement to represent the, um, the the likelihood function. A burst neuron basically operates like this. It has a positive leak and it operates in two phases. During the input phase, because of the positive leak, the memory potential increases. And if some spike is received during this time, the memory potential rates will accelerate. And then during the output phase, the memory potential continues to raise because, uh, of the, because of the positive leak. So when the membrane potential reaches a given threshold, then the neurons start to fire continuously. So in this way, basically, we can see the more spikes received in the input window, then the earlier the neuron will start to fire. And with this burst encoded information, it's very easy for us to find out the maximum va uh, value among the, a set of inputs. We only need an OR gate then the output will be the maximum value of the input. And uh, using the burst neuron, um, another advantage is it allows us to trade off, uh, find the trade off between the performance and accuracy. If we increase the rate of the leakage current, then we can, the neuron can reach the threshold earlier. This means we can shrink the input and output window. Um, and so the detection will be faster. However, um, when the window size gets shrinked, it means we have fewer level of quantization to represent a value. So then the accuracy will uh, decrease. And uh, we, we um, solve the second uh, um, challenge by using a tap gains. So instead of calculating the division, we calculate the multiplication. We use a set of pre-designed gains and their combination to represent the value of one over L, one, one over L T max. And based on the value of the maximum likelihood, the gains uh, will be selected. So this figure shows the um, value of one over Y and its approximation using the tab gains. As we can see, when the, one, the, the value of the denominator gets smaller, then the, we will uh, suffer a large quantization error or we'll su suffer large approximation error. However, when the denominator is large, then the error is, will get smaller. And uh, for, again, for this specific application, the denominator is the maximum likelihood. So usually it's a quite large value. Ha therefore, the approximation error can be tolerated. So um, then we put everything together um, to form the network. So the bottom layer is, are the key lexicons implemented using the burst neuron. 
And on top of it, we have some neurons that uh, implement the pass gate, which uh, let the um, like let the neuron activity of which pass the activity of the neurons corresponding to the actual observation. We also have or function so that it selects the maximum likelihood. And on top of it, we have um, the neuron that implements the tab gains um, to calculate the anomaly score. And then on top of it, we have another um, integrate and fire neuron, which merges all the anomaly scores. And uh, um, the performance of the network actually has, uh, is independent to the size. Um, it only depends on the layers, the layers, the number of layers, and also it depends on the window size. The, um, so the smaller input or output window, then the detection will be faster. And we can actually overlap the input and output window between the adjacent layers. For example, the output window of layer one is actually the input window of the layer two. So in this way, we can reduce the latency for the signal to propagate through the network. So this um, design has been tested on DAPA data set, DAPA um, intrusion detection data set. This data set records the traffic statistics um, of um, network communication every 300 milliseconds. And the design and the network um, and our design is implemented on the True North chip NS1E. So first we show that by limiting the number of um, supporting lexicons for each key lexicon, we can reduce the synapse by 60%. And also we can reduce the number of cores used um, by 50%. However, at a, with a cost at only 1% of the detection quality. And this step is important because it allow us to put a large network onto the chip. And in terms of the detection quality, so we have two True North implementation with different window size, 100 and 10. And we also implemented the NRED in software. This is our reference design because the NRED system um, utilizes unsupervised learning. So we only compare with baseline models, which features um, unsuper uh, unsupervised anomaly detection. These are the self-organizing map and the replic replica neural networks. So um, as we can see for both True North implementation, we outperform the um, baseline algorithm. And uh, actually um, with a large window, we even slightly outperform the, um, the reference design, which is a software implementation of the same model. And this is probably because the training algorithm is stochastic. And uh, we vary the accuracy factor to try to evaluate the relation between the performance and uh, um, the detection quality. So um, when the accuracy factor on uh, range from changes from one to 50, the window size actually reduced from 100 to two. And so the um, detection time drops significantly, reduces significantly. However, at the same time, the detection quality or the AUROC score did not change significantly. However, I need to point out that with very small window size, um, we couldn't find many operation points to give us good trade-off between the false positive and false negative. So um, if we want need to constrain our false positive to be less than 0.1, then the detection quality will drop significantly. And uh, um, we also tested the com and compared the energy efficiency between the True North implementation and some of the um, CPU and the GPU implementations. Um, we see that um, the True North implementation provides more than 10 times energy reduction. And the energy reduction um, actually for different window size um, we see that the power consumption remains approximately the same because the neural activities are 
about the same. However, because um, the performance increases, so basically the time spent on each sample reduces. So that's why the energy um, reduces from um, when we reduce the window size. And uh, we also observed that the true north implementation um, takes slightly longer time per sample compared with the CPU and uh, compared to the GPU implementation. However, as we mentioned, the DAPA data set was recorded every, the data was sampled every 300 millisecond. So this basically means with true north, uh, with the performance of true north, we can still sustain the real time of uh, processing requirement. So um, next I'm talking, I'm going to talking about um, supervised learning that implemented on the uh, Loihi processor. So the widely accepted learning rule in the spike neural network is STDP learning. So, but this rule is basically unsupervised and it takes place only between two adjacent uh, neurons. It cannot be used to, for supervised learning in a deep net neural network. Um, the supervised learning in ANN is usually carried out using back propagation. Using back propagation, the weight is calculated in this way. However, it has suffered several problems if we want to implement this on the neuromorphic hardware. First of all, the activation function of a spiking neuron is not differentiable. And secondly, um, to back propagate the error, we need the um, backward pass. However, in neuromorphic hardware, the connection between neurons is our unidirectional. This basically means we need another network uh, specifically to backward, uh, to feedback the error. And also the back propagation assumes that the error signal is a continuous value. However, in a, a neuromorphic hardware, neurons cannot communicate continuous val value with each other. They only communicate uh, using spikes. And uh, um, also, if we have uh, the back propagation assumes that both forward and backward paths has a copy of weight matrices and they are identical. However, if we need to implement a separate network um, and then keep the two copies of identical weights and keep the coherence between these two copy, then it will be very expensive. And finally, um, the weight update requires information from I minus one layer from the previous layer and the next layer. Therefore, the update is not local. So um, we adopted a set of approximations to implement the back propagation. First of all, we, we create a separate network to back propagate the error signal. And then um, we use a shifted ReLU function to um, approximate the spike count, to approximate the relation between the membrane potential and the spike count. And this is our approximation of the um, activation function. Then with this approximation, we can calculate the derivative of the activation function, which will be a constant value if the membrane potential is greater than the threshold or zero otherwise. And uh, we approximate or we use spike, uh, we represent the error signals using spike trains. And uh, um, the value um, is approximated as the spiking rate. However, because the error could be either positive or negative, so we use two channels of spike trains, positive channel and a negative channel to represent the error. And the neuron in the um, backward pass can still uh, be implemented using the typical integrate and fire neuron because it only needs to implement this function the integrate and integration function. And uh, um, so, so now whatever in the blue box 
is calculated by the neurons in the feedback pass. The actually this result corresponding to the error in the um, um, basically it's corresponding to the error signal in the ice layer. So now we forward this error signal to the um, we, we send this error signal to the neurons in the forward pass. And uh, so these error signals, again, they're in the form of spikes, right? And uh, these error signals will change the membrane potential of this neuron in the forward pass, and eventually will change, will change the output spiking activity of these neurons. So if we use HI to represent the spiking activity after receiving the error signal, and we use H hat to represent the spiking activity before receiving the error, then the difference of these two basically is proportional to the error signal. And we know that the delta W is calculated as the output activity of the previous neuron times the error. So it can also be calculated as the spiking rate of this of the neuron I after correction, after receiving the error, right? Minus the spiking rate of this neuron before the receiving the error. Multiply with the input spiking rate of this neuron I. So in other words, now we have all the information that can be found locally in neuron I. So we can update the weight locally um, inside the new this neuron. So now we have converted the, um, we have achieved the local learn learning. And, and I should say that this equation is very similar to the rate-based SDDP proposed by Benjo in their work 20, in 2016. And so we call this whole procedure error modulated SDDP. So we still have another problem that is we still need to store two copies of the weights in two networks. This can be solved by using random feedback alignment, which published in a paper on by Lily Crab in, 20, um, in 2015. So um, basically based on the paper, if we use a random matrix in the feedback pass, it can still um, back propagate useful error informations. So instead of storing the um, original or the, the weight matrix, we just use a random matrix here in the backward pass. So we even try to skip those hidden layers in the backward pass and directly feed back the errors, the errors from the output layer to those um, intermediate layers. And we call this approach direct feedback alignment. So, um, all the inference and the learning, I should say that all the inference and the learning take place in the forward pass. And the backward pass only is only used to back propagate the errors. And for the implementation on Loihi, we adopted a two phase. In the first phase uh, or the free response phase, the, inf the inference in the forward pass depends only on the input signals. And during this phase, we collect the information of H hat. That's the spiking activity before the error correction. And later, the second phase in this correction phase, the error starts to propagate back in the feedback pass, and then also being forwarded to the neurons in the forward pass. And during this phase, we start to collect, uh, we can collect the H i which is the spiking activity of neurons um, after correction. And then um, we calculate, using this information, we can calculate the data um, weight or the weight update. So we tested uh, um, the design first um, using software implementation on several data sets. This include MNIST, Fashion MNIST, Australian Sign Language, and MSTAR. And uh, um, the network here are either two layer or three layer fully connected network. 
And as we can see, compared with vanilla back propagation, which is um, implemented using AMM, the um, EMS TDP gives quiet competitive learning results. And then we implemented it on the Intel Loihi processor. Uh, we use a two layer, we use two layer convolution uh, network. So, and the two layer fully connect, two fully connected layers. Because Loihi does not support weight sharing, so we have to train the convolution layers. Um, um, basically, we have to pre train the two convolution layers. And then, however, these convolution layers are still implemented in the Loihi and uh, as part of the forward network. And their inference time and the energy dissipation are considered during the experiment. So this table compares the Loihi, the learning result for the Loihi implementation and the software implementation. The software implementation is fully um, is based on the floating point. So we can see that um, although the Loihi, um, the, the model learned on Loihi is slightly um, worse than the floating point based version, but the result is still quite competitive. And this table shows the energy dissipation um, that we collected on Loihi and on um, CPU and the GPUs. And again, we can see that um, the Loihi provide very um, high energy efficiency compared to other implementations. So um, we try to change the number of neurons that packed on the same core um, in order to find a trade-off between the um, learning time, between the performance and the power consumption. If we put more neurons on the same core because they share the same hardware, then the performance will be reduced. But on the same time, we use less number of cores. So by uh, extensive clock gating or power gating, we can reduce the power. So in this figure, um, with the increase of the core utilization, um, the time the, the, um, or the latency, which is represented by the blue line, actually increase. And the power consumption and the number of cores consumed which are represented by the red and the pink lines, the jobs. So their product, which is the energy, actually first reduce and then increase. So it means there is a sweet spot of the core utilization that can uh, you maximize the energy efficiency. And we further apply this Loihi system um, to, for incremental online learning. So similar as the experiment by He in CVPR paper, um, we randomly selected four uh, classes from the MNIST data set and used these to pre-train a model. And then for the other six classes, we divided them into three groups. So every time we've, we put in uh, two new classes and use them to test the uh, model, obviously the model performed very poorly because these new classes have never been seen before. And then we divided the 600 samples of the, each class into five trunks and then uh, retrain the model. And during the training, two steps are used. First, we retrain the model only use the new classes. And then we retrain the model using the mix of new and old classes. So as we can see, after we retrained the model, the accuracy gradually gained back. But I, I would say that, uh, and this red line basically indicated the, um, the, the, the ideal model, which are trained using 10 different, 10 classes all together. So at the end, we still, um, the accuracy of the retrain model still slightly beneath the, below the um, ideal model. However, it's much better than the unretrained one. And all the inference and the training are, uh, uh, took place in the same hardware. So um, next, I will talk about some of our work in um, basically um, spatial temporal pattern detection. So all the neural models that uh, we have discussed so far based on the integrated and fire or leaky integrated fire model. But the biological model is actually has much richer functionality. 
um, previous neuroscience research showed that the dendritic trees in individual neuron have the capacity to perform computations. A realistic model of a synapse or the connection between neurons should be a low pass filter. And this kind of dynamic allows a single neuron to have memory and the capable for temporal processing. And basically it's very important for the um, temporal um, pattern detection and classification. So in our work, we model the neurons um, as a network of filters. So the, um, each synapse is a leaky integrate path, low pass filter with kernel K. And each, um, and after the re issuing uh, an output spike, the neuron does not reset immediately. It's as if the output spike goes through another filter and apply back to the neuron um, potential, membrane potential. So, and each filter can actually be represented, digit, implemented digitally using an I, as an IIR filter or integrate um, or infinite impulse response filter. So basically we can rewrite um, and re-represent the neural model in this way. And in this model, as we can see, the output of the neuron actually is not only does not only depend on the current input, but also depends on the inputs in all the previous histories. So that's why the neuron has the capability of detection, detecting the um, um, temporal patterns. And in this model, all the parameters, alpha, beta, all these um, filter coefficients or weight coefficients can be trained using back propagation through time. And uh, um, so we also use the uh, gradient surrogate in order to handle the non-differentiable activation function. So we use the spike probability instead of the heap side step function for the activation function. So using this um, more realistic neuron model, we, we can um, basically detect um, or we can do classification of not only MNIST, but uh, data sets such as neuromorphic MNIST or IBM gesture data set. So the neuromorphic MNIST and the gesture data set are basically time sequences. They are generated by event cameras. The event camera detects the change and detect and report the change in the pixel values. So compare with, with uh, compare the event camera with the conventional camera, we can see that it's very energy efficient. And uh, um, our experimental result shows that um, our model basically outperform all the previous works. And uh, um, especially in the gestured um, um, data set, we outperformed all the previous works quite significantly. And we also evaluated the impact of um, optimized filter kernels. As we mentioned, we not in our approach, we not only train the weight coefficients, but we also train the filter kernels. And all the filters are initialized as um, based on a kernel represented by this red curve. And after training, they diverge and represented by those uh, lighter curves. So kernel actually con controls um, how long an information, past information will be memorized. It is similar as the forgetting gate in the LSTM. So having a set of diverged kernel basically means the information is assigned with different importance and they will be memorized or forget at different speed. So our result shows that uh, optimized kernel has almost no impact on the MNIST because the MNIST input is static. It has no, not much temporal information. However, it gives it has much significant impact on the IBM gesture data set. So it means a set of di a diverse the kernel is very important for the inputs with temporal information. So um, with those um, neurons that capable of detecting temporal uh, pattern, we can encode the neuron input 
using a very efficient encoding, which is called temporal coding. So read coding basically needs to convert. So given a given given the input sensor reading, which is a time sequence, using read coding, we have to convert this time sequence into a vector by buffering them. And then each number in this vector will be represented by a sequence of spikes. And the rate of spike represents the value. So this means we need a lot of input and a lot of switching activities. However, if we can represent the number of value using the interval between the spikes, then we only need one input and one sequence of the spikes with very low switching activity. And we can use a linear um, a leaky integrated and a fire neuron uh, to represent, to um, basically encode, to perform the temporal encoding. We call it time encoding machine. And it can be proved that time encoding machine is lossless as long as the output interspike interval satisfies certain condition. And this condition can be guaranteed by selecting the neuron coefficients uh, carefully. However, in our approach, we do not manually design those neurons and we, we learn this by using BPTT, back propagation through time. And moreover, traditional encoding basically encode each input using one spike sequence and they use identical neurons or encoders. This is not efficient because um, each neuron can only be optimized for a specific input range. Um, therefore, in our approach, we use multiple neurons. We use N neurons to encode M input. And uh, the connection between the input and the neuron actually can also be learned. So by using this um, encoding and uh, um, uh, new encode, the temporal encoding and by using the neuron with temporal dynamics, we can um, classify or we can perform um, complicated signal processing um, of the inputs from the sensors. In this example, we apply the system to classify um, sign language. And the data is received from a sense 22 sensors located on the data globe. And uh, the, as we can see, the sensor reading are continuous. However, after the encoding, they're converted into a set of very sparse uh, spike trains. And then the spike train will affect the membrane potential of the neurons in the later stage, and finally the detection is made. Compared with rate coding, we can see that um, the temporal coding consumes 90% of la uh, less inputs, and it reduces the spiking activity by 93%. And uh, um, it also reduced the number of computations by 96%. And more importantly, because we encode this inputs while receiving the inputs. So as long as a signature pattern emerges, the detection can be made immediately. So it allows early detection. And, and uh, we also apply the system for other data sets. And it shows that um, the spiking based approach, right, gives almost a similar or better performance than the artificial neural network based approach. By, and that's because the new, each neuron has more complicated dynamics. And also we show that compared with one-to-one -one mapping, the population coding actually performs better. And an interesting observation we had is, um, random population actually performs quite good um, compared with the optimized population. This basically means we can use some circuits that are known to be inaccurate or has high variations or unreliable to implement, this in to implement the encoder. And as long as this circuit gives enough randomness or enough diversity, then they work just fine. So at the, end, at the end, I want to very quickly talk about the uh, possibility of using mixed signal implementation. So as we can see now, um, 
because it's very efficient to implement a filter using analog uh, circuits. So a mixed signal uh, implementation may be a promising hardware solution for this type of network. So we can use analog filter for the synapse and the output. And then we can use a mem resistive array to implement the weight matrix. And uh, we can use digital network on chip to achieve the um, interneuron communications. So if you are interested of this work, um, you can refer to our deck paper this year. So um, as conclusions, um, so we, I introduced several of our works um, for different applications carried out on the neuromorphic hardware and it, uh, using neuromorphic um, algorithms. So we showed that um, the neuromorphic hardware provide a significant energy saving compared to CPU and GPU implementation due to the new computing paradigm and their its von Neumann architecture. And also we have shown that with efficient information coding, processing and online adaptation, we believe that neuromorphic computing model and hardware will be a suitable platform for some applications such as sensor and control related real-time applications. Okay, so, so with this, um, I'm ready for questions. And sorry that it took quite a long time. No, perfect. Um, thanks a lot for your very uh, engaging talk, Jinru. And we have a first question already now in the chat. Um, so it's a question on your second project. How is the weight written into the synapse synapse in Loi? How much energy it takes to update the synaptic weight memory when learning? How is the training time on Loi compared with um, CPU or GPU? That's actually three questions. Um, so I think um, the question is talking about how the updated, how the weight is updated, right? So the uh, Loihi provide a way um, to update the weight. So the weight change actually can be calculated as the sum of product of some variables. And these variables are, they call traces. These traces are, um, could be e either input or output spiking activity or the leaky integration of the spiking event. So, and these are basically already recorded by Loihi chip. And we can program it. Um, we can pick the variables and program it to calculate the data weight. And then the weight will automatically update it by the hardware. Um, and the second question, um, let me see. The it was about the energy it takes to right. update the synaptic weight memory. Um, here I gave the energy um, for both training and the testing. So, um, so basically, the, I, I guess the difference is the energy that running, I should say, uh, the difference is because in the training, we still have another network, that's the feedback network, it uh, consumes some energy, and also, of course, the neuron in the forward pass also need to calculate the weight update. So I think you probably can consider this as the difference as the energy of learning. And uh, um, the next question is, how is the training? the training time on Loi compared with uh, CPU or GPU? I don't remember actually. <laughs> uh, my students probably know better, but obviously it's slower than, I don't know compare how to compare with CPU, but it's obviously slower than GPU. Um, yeah. I don't have exact answer for that. Okay. Um, we have Ramtin asking a question. Can you just unmute yourself? Sure. Oh, yeah. There we go. Thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Three very interesting projects. I actually have two questions. Let's start with the first one. And if we have time, I'll go to the second question. So for the third project, uh, if I understood correctly, this was very interesting because usually the thing that we do for capturing the temporal relation is just encoding. But if I understand correctly, you combine both and temporal encoding and a kind of recurrent spike in the network. 
and is that right? You know, with the gesture detection, because I could see that you have both temporal encoding and a kind of recurrent. Uh, yes. Spiking yes. Balls. So in order to uh, utilize, we know that temporal encoding is more efficient than rate coding. However, in order to utilize the temporal coding, we need something that's capable of detecting the um, temporal pattern hmm. from the encoded spike trains. So we must have the, the neuron that I mentioned before with the oh. dynamics, temporal dynamics. Okay, so historically, I, that's, that's my question was merely historically, they simply use a temporal encoding and they're leaking the ring of fire and like some kind of like a reward based SDDP to capture the temporal associations. I wanted to know if you have done a comparison like this to just have an encoding temporal and using conventional feed forward spike neural networks and see how it's gonna uh, work because a lot of recent work and that's something that I think makes your work very interesting because a lot of recent work they use simply feed forward spike neural networks and temporal coding. Mm -hmm. So did you have any comparison with just using temporal coding and conventional people who are spiking on the works? Um, we didn't. We didn't try to use a normal, like just a leaky integrate neuron to process the uh, sequence encoded using the temporal encoding mm -hmm. because we, we thought it's not possible. <laughs> it won't give good results. So. Yeah, that would be interesting because a lot of people do it now. Like these days, a lot of time series analysis is not based on this temporal neurons. And I think that's going to be very beneficial what you're doing compared to a lot of these time series analysis. But overall, very interesting. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have another question in the chat at the moment. Um, so that refers to on slide 19, you mentioned unsupervised learning. Um, can unsupervised learning be uh, generalized to deep network? Um, yes. So I believe there has been at works um, in applying unsupervised the learning to deep neural network. Um, um, for example, I think Panda um, and the Roy uh, has similar work. Um, however, how do I say this? Still, even though it's unsupervised learning, it still needs some um, error signals. Uh, if we want to, basically, if we want to do super, okay, that, that's supervised learning, okay. So, so the unsupervised learning, obviously, they can be used to, to pre-train the neural network, um, and they have been applied to pre-train the neural network. But yeah, if we need to do supervised learning, that we have to propagate the error. But if you just want unsupervised learning, then um, it can be used to uh, basically for like automatic feature um, learning or automatic feature detection. It, there has been works on that. Okay, actually, I have a question on the supervised learning. In the, your results, you showed the difference between learning with just the new classes versus, versus the new and the old classes. Um, yeah, that was a little bit here. Yeah, yeah, the, this slide. Um, uh, can can you motivate this a bit? Why why there is this um, difference uh, when you take the two step learning technique uh, when when you uh, retrain with new and old classes? Um. So the the green line means we retrain only use the uh, new classes. And the, yeah. the blue line means we, we retrain with a mixture of new and old classes. But when we test, we uh, we test them with a mixture. So um, ah, okay. yeah. So if, if we retrain only the new one, then we will suffer from the catastrophic forgetting. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um do we have more questions?
apparently not, which is pretty much a perfect landing since we're uh, exactly at the top of the hour. So once again, thank you very much for uh, being with us today, Jindru, and for, for your great presentation and for um, the Q&A. And um, let me also take this um, opportunity to briefly remind everybody in the audience, this was the last um, pilot talk for the Processing and Memory Technology Workshop, which will happen uh, in about two weeks from now, March 17 to 18 as a virtual event. Um, please take a look at the website. You can just Google it, NSF PIM Workshop. You will find it right away and it should be in the mails, which you have received. If you have not signed up yet uh, for this event, I do encourage you um, to do so. We're um, hoping that prospective participants will um, provide a short position paper on their ideas about processing and memory so that we can have um, really excellent um, discussions and interactions at this workshop. So we're looking forward to seeing um, a lot of you from the audience there in about two weeks, as I said. And um, for now, thanks again for joining and uh, have a wonderful um, day and uh, weekend ahead, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.